Good morning and welcome to this very dark and ominous sunrise safari. We've got a big cloud bank above us and I'm quite excited for that because it's going to stay dark a little bit longer, which is maybe going to give us another chance with that unrelaxed male leopard. By the way, my name is Brent Deer Smith. I have Jandre on camera and there's Jamie and Dangerous Dave on the other vehicle and Louise and Geraldine in final control. So I had a look at a lot of the pictures of that male leopard yesterday. And I, I do agree it is the one that you guys saw with uh, Scott and Vim earlier or last year. And it is the one that the guys in the north call Kajima. However, having a look at his Facebook page, I'm afraid I do not agree with his age at all. I do not think he was he's six or seven years old. Uh, I think he's a bit younger. Uh, now, I have seen another male leopard who's quite a bit bigger and older than him uh, when I was driving my friends out of Juma. And to say he mated with Karula, which a lot of you think he might have, oh, I think he's a little bit on the young side to have done that. Uh, it's not impossible, let's just say it's improbable. Um, but he is definitely coming to the age to start challenging for territory. Did you hear that high-pitched call there, Jean-Dre? Now, the likelihood of finding it is, is quite un unlikely, but that is an African goshawk calling. Uh, I don't think we're going to... And they often call before dawn. Very high pitch. So he's up in the air somewhere high. So we're not going to see him. So I do agree that it is the male they call Gajima. I don't think he's as old as people think he is, though. I think he's a little bit younger. And um, I'm quite sure there's going to be maybe some agreement, some disagreement with me. But I have spent an inordinate amount of time with leopards over the years. So I think he's a little bit younger, I think. He's probably a year or two younger than people think he is. Now, the reason for that is that we had a very good look at him up in the tree last night, and he doesn't, he's got the start of a dewlap. He doesn't have a big dewlap yet. Uh, I think he is sort of getting to the stage where he will challenge for territory. Uh, whether he succeeds or not is a completely another story. And with male leopards, it's easy to tell whether they're an adult or not. And unless you know that particular leopard since he's a cub, it's, it's near impossible to be exact on the edge. So I, but I do definitely believe he's below five years old, uh, just judge, judging from his, his, his face, scars, neck. Uh, he's got a bit of growing to do still. Uh, he is a, a, a big boy, there's no doubt about that. But I don't think he's reached adult, full male adulthood yet. There's no dewlap, but he is a beautiful boy. And I do agree he is that Gajima male. But there's it's, it's, a, it's, it's, always, it's always fun, because I'm sure there's going to be lots of people who disagree with me. Or well, at least people have something to talk about. But as I said, yeah, I think he's about five. says he really, really hopes we get to see this new leopard today. He was very cool yesterday. I agree with you, Carl. I think our chances mm, are about, let's, let's be optimistic, a four out of 10 of seeing him. Uh, there wasn't much food left, but he was quite full. So if he went for a drink and decided to come back a bit later, then maybe we will get a chance to see him again. But uh, I think he might have finished that kill and moved on. 
uh, but fingers crossed. But while we head towards that area, uh, let's go see Jamie so she can bid you a wonderful good morning. Good morning and welcome to a cloudy sunrise safari. As always, it is wonderful to have you on board. And how wonderful is this that we've managed to, or actually that Brent has managed to put in so much in the way of hours. We're finally getting that leopard, new leopard for us all, to relax a little bit in the presence of vehicles. And hopefully, even if Brent doesn't find him this morning, although fingers crossed he will, but even if he doesn't, in future, hopefully we'll have more sightings of this wonderful phantom leopard to look forward to. Exciting prospects. On my side, I'm making my way slowly back to where we had Karula with a Nyala kill yesterday afternoon on the Sunset Safari. She did a very good job of ducking both Brent and myself yesterday morning. Not intentionally, I don't think. I think she was just hunting. We just missed seeing her on the road. And she'd, by the time we returned to that area in the afternoon, she had doubled back on her tracks gone down into the drainage line and caught a Nyala. Nyala's currently, or when I left, the Nyala was hanging from a Tamburti tree above the drainage line. I want to wait until it's a little bit lighter before I head to that area for a couple of reasons. Most importantly, I don't want to miss her tracks, depending on where, if she's finished her kill, if she's still around that area, or if she's decided to move back towards her cubs. But also, I just, just as a precaution, just in case, She's brought those cubs through towards the carcass. I want to make sure that it's fully light when we go and check. It's unlikely, but it is a possibility. And if she's not there, then we shall follow her tracks and see if we can't figure out where that den site is. Not, not specifically. Good morning. Sorry, everybody. Sorry, sorry. Come, little one. All right. Okay, there you go. Somebody's feeling a little bit dozy this morning. There we go. All right. Yes, just to try and figure out if her den is on Juma or if it is still to the south of our boundary around the Little Gowrie area. But that's my plan for this morning depending on what happens. By the way, just an update for those of you who've been closely following the drives and wondering where those Nkuhuma lionesses wandered off to. They crossed into Simbambili yesterday afternoon. So after the sunrise safari, they must have been somewhere hiding on Vuyatela or Juma, despite my best efforts of <laughs> tracking them and going for a walk. I didn't find them. But they crossed out sometime yesterday afternoon and went into Simbambili. From what I've heard, it was still just the two of them in that area. So the, th the remaining three remain mysteries as to where they've disappeared off to. to Safari Guy, who is one of our newer viewers. And Safari Guy has commented on Twitter to say that he feels perhaps his questions might be considered a little bit too silly to ask. I promise you they are absolutely not. And in fact, we love hearing from new viewers because sometimes, and I know, I know personally I'm guilty of it, I start to take the the, the knowledge of the viewers for granted. A lot of our viewers have been watching for years and years. And so we launch into lengthy discussions without really touching on the basics. So Safari Guy, it's really not a problem if you send through questions that might seem basic to you. And the chances are they're probably not. Some of the best questions I've ever been asked have been preceded by the words, this is a silly question, but and they hardly ever are. So I'm really, there's very few questions I've ever been asked in my life that I would consider to be particularly silly to the point that I felt like not answering or <laughs> just rejecting them outright. I'll tell you the, one of the silliest questions I was ever asked. 
And Safari Guy, I'm not saying that that would be your issue at all, but it was with a volunteer who admittedly had asked some relatively interesting questions for, for someone um, who had been around the bush for about three or so weeks. But we were doing road clearing, which meant I took them out with pangas, like machetes, and saws and gloves, and off we went to go and clear the branches out of the road. Good morning, Dugger boys. Some dark shapes looming up out of the gloom. I'm not going to shine on my lights on them. But yes, the, the question that I was asked was, by a guy standing next to a tree, just standing next to a buffalo thorn, speaking about buffaloes in the gloom, and he turned to me and he said, is this a thorn tree? Uh, morning station, this is Chris going mobile, any aspects? So I think that probably qualifies as one of the weirdest questions I've been asked. You know, when you, it's different if you're watching through a screen to ask if something is a thorn tree, but when you're standing next to it, I do feel as though that's an assessment you could probably make on your own. That might be one of my winning silly questions. I mean, the thorns were not, not hidden at all. But other than that, I've never really considered a question silly. And I generally try to answer the questions as best. And you might even find, Safari Guy, that I don't know the answer to your question, which I will happily admit, you do get to the point where one is, or one does get to the point where one is very happy to just say, I really don't know. It's impossible to know everything out here. And you might even find that your question sparks an interest within me to do some further research. And we end up helping out each other. So please don't be shy. Safari Guy and any new viewers, please don't be shy to send through questions because you think they might be silly or you think that the other viewers might have heard it before. I don't think they'll mind either. have a question from one of our 12 year old viewers Sabrina and Sabrina has been inspired in watching Safari Live that's really sparked an interest within her and a love of animals so morning Sabrina I really hope that you've been enjoying the work that you've been doing the volunteering work you've been doing I think it was I'm not sure which zoo it was at but I know that you were busy working there but Sabrina wanted to know she's been watching a documentary on Africa and wanted to know if we have monkey beetles in this area. So there you go, there's a question that I don't know monkey beetles. Uh, there's a lot of different insects that are named after monkeys. There's monkey moths, um, monkey owl moths, but I don't know specifically of any monkey beetles in this particular area, Sabrina. I'll double check that just to make sure when I do have an opportunity. But to the best of my knowledge, no, we don't get any monkey beetles. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about them. See if we can't, if I can't learn something about an insect outside of my area of expertise. And Sabrina, I, what I would suggest as well is that you ask that question to Brent, because Brent has traveled much further up into Africa than I have. And he spent a great deal of time living around Central Africa, Gabon, Tanzania, all those sorts of areas so maybe it's a, a beetle that is isolated to the more rainforest type areas and perhaps he can answer that for you as well whether or not he has any experiences with monkey beetles we might even find sabrina depending on what it is that we do get them here but we just call them by a different name that does occasionally happen there's never necessarily a consensus throughout the world as to exactly what an animal's common name is and that in fact is why very often when you hear us talking about bird species we'll often say a name and then correct ourselves and give a second name and that's because for most of us we've learned certain names as children and throughout our lives and those have suddenly been changed to the 
Well, due to the fact that people around the world are trying to sort of join up. So, we just saw that male leopard. Uh, he was doing a million miles an hour. Now, I think he just ran away from a herd of elephants. So, the elephants have chased him. I just want to go see, he ran across, unfortunately, into Torchwood. Um, so, we're just going to go see if he's got any meat left. But he, he literally just flew across the road in front of us. There, are a, there is a big herd of elephants heading this way. So let's just go see if he's got any meat left, and then he might be back if that's the case. If his meat is finished and there's elephants around, I think I'm afraid for now, we might not see too much more of him. Well, I'm not seeing any tree climbing kudus. Not even seeing a kudu leg, I'm afraid. So this is where he had the kill last night. And what, and the hyena was below him. So I think it's safe to say he's done. I'm gonna go back to the road and see if he's maybe stopped. We might get one last visual of him. But I think those Ellies have really spooked him. Ruining my leopard morning. So I know Jamie has just welcomed our new viewer safari guy who's wondering, do we ever leave our vehicle and track on foot? He said he's seen that on African safaris, people are encouraged to stay in their car to avoid attack and serious bodily harm. Well, if you are just a visitor, I think it's a very wise idea to stay in your car. However, um, for us who have had lots of time and lots of experience in the bush we often leave our car to track and strange enough this leopard who just disappeared across the road uh, i found him on foot following where he had dragged that little kudu he had killed so uh, we do leave the foot uh, we do leave the vehicle we do leave the foot my goodness it must be early um, we do leave the vehicle quite frequently and head out on foot as uh, specifically when there are tracks to follow uh, it's much easier often to find lions and leopards on foot when tracking than it is from the vehicle. So we do, we do leave our vehicles. And uh, when you come on an African safari, you can go on a bushwalk with an experienced guide, but uh, you shouldn't do it by yourself. So this is where he ran across. He ran into these thickets here. I'm gonna see if his eyes pop out and shine at us. But I'm, I'm, I definitely have a feeling that those elephants have really freaked them out. There's multiple elephant herds in the area. And if he's got no meat to stay around, I think he's definitely going to be on the move. And we might get a, a a sighting of him. I think he's heading back to the north. He has been seen mostly around the area of Kayamanzi um, in Buffalzook, and he doesn't venture outside too often. I'm just going to keep checking here very carefully. But unfortunately, this is our 
eastern traverse boundary, so we can go this side and we can't go that side, and he went that way at some high speed. Now, if we don't succeed with him, at least we've got some elephants to look at. But we have made some incredible progress with this leopard. I mean, last night we managed to get within about 10 meters of him. We started at about 80 meters and just slowly over the last two days moved, inched is probably a better description, closer and closer. And I think he's now done and he's gonna move off. It's very, very sad, but that is life. And we're gonna have to wait till I can find his footprints on Juma again before we can try continue following him. Often we can find out where they've gone from the alarm calls. There's quite a lot of cystic killers, which are a little brown bird in this area. And let's just listen for a second. There's a herd of Ellie's here, and there's another herd of Ellie's behind us. Uh, Megan is wondering, what is a dewlap? Um, when I was chatting about his age, I mentioned the fact that he had he didn't have a well-developed dewlap. A dewlap is basically a big thick piece of skin that hangs below uh, his throat. And you get them in quite a few different animals. So leopards, uh, even actually from the antelope point of view, is a very distinct one that has a dewlap. And if we think about Tingana, he's got that big thick layer of skin under his neck. Now, that is to defend themselves while fighting. I'm just trying to see um, if we've got, oh. Lions calling in the distance. Quite far away. Fortunately, not again outside our Travis zone. There we go, we should have it. Jamie, Jamie, Chris. And just turn that down while we're listening. Um, and let me have a, there we go. I think that's gonna be the well, we can't really see it there. Um, but if we have a look, there's Tingana. Um, I'm just trying to see. You can't really see it. I'm just trying to see if I've got a photo. But if you look at Tingana, you can see there's an adult male leopard. You can see how much more developed the neck is than um, this guy. So the dewlap is this big fat layer of skin below the neck that um, will often hang when he's walking. Obviously, I'm just, he's just. I'm going to try to see if I've got another picture where he's not mating. I might show the dewlap a little bit there. There, look at that. You can see that thick layer of skin below his neck. You can see how much bigger around the neck and head he is. And now, Tingana's about eight, eight years old, so very developed dewlap. And leopards over six start showing that dewlap quite, quite extensively. So. This male, to me, hasn't developed that big dewlap. That's what makes me think he's, he's around five, maybe a little bit younger. But very interesting nonetheless. And it's a very, very common trait in, in male leopards. Now, he's run off. Now we're going to do something that I think most people might think is a little bit strange. We're going to go back to under that kill, or where the kill was. And. Uh, we're going to search for kitty litter. So I need to find some feces of that leopard uh, to pop in this little vial uh, to do with a genetics um, and project that's being run by a, an organization called Panthera. So to assert the sort of lineages of leopards, who's daddy, who's mommy, etc. Well, mommy, you generally know because they look after the cubs, but 
to a certain, a certain whose daddy is very difficult. The female leopards will mate with four or five uh, different males uh, when they're in the Easter cycle. So all the males they might possibly come into contact with think they're all daddy. So a lot of people immediately assume that the dominant male from the area is the father, which is often incorrect. It's, and the same with lions. Often 50% of the cubs are not born to the dominant males in the area. They're born to interlopers, uh, single male lions whose whole life strategy is to sneak in and mate on the sly and then get out of dodge. Now, with leopards, it's a little bit different. The females will actively go and seek any male they might possibly come into contact with. There's the kudu up ahead. And we did notice the kudu hanging around. I'm pretty sure this is the the group of kudu that that this leopard caught the youngster out. I'm still I'm still searching in the half hope that we're gonna see him, but I don't think so. And I also want to go look for that scat uh, before the elephants move in properly. But while I look for scat, we're going to jump on with Jamie, who's going to check what's happening around Karula's kill. OK. So we've arrived back at the site of Karula's kill. As you can see, the top half of the Inyala is still safely tucked in her larder in the Tambuerti tree. And there's still a lot of meat left on that carcass. So she will return. This is pretty much what I expected to find. I had a feeling she was not going to be around necessarily and that she might be back feeding her cubs. But you can see she's picked an ice tree in which to put her kill. It's nice and high. It's nice and stable as well, so it hasn't fallen out. The only way that she could risk losing it now is if a tawny eagle or a batelier comes and dislodges it from the branches by feeding on it. But hopefully it will stay here and we will have a chance to see her a bit later. In the meantime, let's have a look at one of the scavengers of our mystery leopard's kill. So as we got back to the tree, oh, there was a hyena that was checking to see if there was any titbits left, but uh, obviously decided there wasn't any. So we thought it might hang around a little bit longer. So we're on the dung quest, or the leopard scat quest. Now I'm hoping the hyena hasn't eaten the leopard scat, which they do do. Oh, there's another hyena. That could be another reason why that leopard was so unrelaxed this morning. Now, he came down the tree and he went that way, so... I I'm going to look for scat slightly to the northeast of us here. And uh, hopefully I am able to find some. So while I and my vial go looking for scat, if I do find some, we will come back and I'll show you how to collect a scientific sample. But till then, and let's go see what Jamie's up to. You've arrived at the perfect time to, if you want to watch me do a 20-point turn in order to turn around. Now, Dave, you were with Brent when he fell into the hole yesterday morning and got stuck trying to do the same thing. So are you feeling slightly nervous, Dave? Um, um, <laughs> That's good. That was a good answer. Either way, it is going to be a 20-point turn, so I'm afraid you're all going to have to bear with me. Brent got stuck just over there. <laughs> It's not, although, as he said, it's not stuck unless somebody has to rescue you, and nobody had to rescue him. He did manage to get out himself. It happens to all of us. There we go. I think, though, we have managed our turnaround with a minimum degree of fuss. There we go. And off we go down the drainage line. Let's have a quick look here. There I see all the twigs and the logs that Brent had to put under his wheel. Right, now my plan is to start heading south, see if I can see where she's crossed backwards and forwards along Gowrie Main, or if she's crossed backwards and forwards along Gowrie Main. 
and it just will give us a little bit of a better idea if her den site is still on the southern side of our boundary or if she's moved them a bit closer to this area. It'll be very interesting to find out. And then once we've done that, we will see where the morning takes us and then return back to the site a little bit later towards the end of the sunset safari. Maybe she will decide to come back and have some breakfast from that kill. What was extraordinary about it yesterday, I mean, yesterday when we saw her, she was very full and relatively flat. In fact, very flat. She just wanted to lie down and rest after all of her exertions of the morning. But she'd eaten half of that in the space of the few hours between drives. So half an inyana, and I've seen Karula do that before. Oh, I've seen a lot of leopards do it before, but I have seen Karula do it with a steenbok that she devoured the entire little antelope. And yes, they're little antelope, but they're still, you know, there's a good couple of kilograms of meat there. And I saw her devour the entire thing from hooves to nose to skull, Every single part of that antelope was eaten, except for a tiny piece of jawbone. So although we always think of the hyenas as the bone-crushing experts, leopards are not, if not equally capable of eating large bones, but they are definitely capable of crunching bones. It's one of the reasons why leopard scat does occasionally turn white. The difference is, with hyena scat, hyena scat turns very, very white, almost all of the time. Whereas with leopard scat, it doesn't always do that, even despite the amount of bones that they consume. And that's because not only are a hyena's jaws better suited for chewing the bits of bone, a lot of the time leopards cough up in the same, same way domestic cats cough up hairballs. The leopards will cough up big chunks of bone and hoof. But they will also, their digestive system is also not adapted in the same way that a hyena's is. So a hyena has incredibly powerful stomach acid, far, far more acidic than any of the other animals out here. And that's the way that they go about or are adapted to digesting the bits of bone that they eat and utilizing them in a far more effective manner. And that's why we usually see the whiteness of the bone coming through in hyena scat rather than regularly in leopard or lion scat, despite the fact that all three of them are capable of consuming bone, particularly with young animals. Thank you, Dave. Dave just turned off my headlights for me. Mm. Now, on a cool, cloudy day like this morning, it just makes tracking a little bit more difficult. Spotting the tracks, particularly with leopard, is not always the easiest venture in the world. I seem to remember I lost signal here, so let's go around. And speaking of scat and our discussion, I believe that Brent has been on the lookout for some Ijima scat. Let's see if he's found any, and perhaps we can go and observe the scientific process at work. So, unfortunately, I don't have a pen, so I'm going to have to fill this out uh, when I get home. So, this little thing, it's a common name, which would be Lepod, a scientific name, Pantheris Pardist. Collector, Brent. Sample number, I think this will be my sample number four. Uh, country, South Africa, GPS location, I'll do that shortly. The date and individual ID. So. There's silica in there, so it doesn't get disturbed, and um, provide you with a little toothpick, which is actually quite ineffectual when it comes to collecting scat. I might use another, another stick, something slightly larger. So the most important thing is you don't want to get any of your epithelials. So epithelials are your skin tissue anywhere around the inside because that can obviously, it degrades or makes it more difficult for them to pick up the leopard ep epithelials. So I'm go not going to use that little toothpick. I'm going to choose my own toothpick. 
probably not a toothpick, more like a, a stick. And that looks like a good stick. There you go, something a bit larger. So he has defecated inside where the elephant have dug up something. Now this is a very smelly process. Now you can imagine. Ugh, I'm not going to smell it, and I really don't feel like that. So I want to put it straight in. Oh, lost some of it. Let's get some more. Now, there we go. Lots of hair. Oh, very smelly. Some bone fragments. There we go. That should be enough. Now, you don't ever want to touch predator scat with your hands. It's got lots and lots of nasty little things in it, uh, such as liver flukes, nasty tapeworms and stuff. But there we go. We've got a scientific sample to deliver uh, to the Panthera project manager in this area, whose name is Michael, and happens to be Candace from Juma's husband. OK, let's put that somewhere safe. Move all my stuff out of the way. We don't want to get any nasties on my large... Oh, that I'm going to have to fill out when I get home. Let me just put that in a safe place in my pelican case there. There we go. We have collected some scat. So if he ha is related uh, to one of the leopards in the Sabi Sands, uh, that will be picked up from the DNA. I don't think he is. I think he has come from the Kruger or somewhere where there's not a lot of vehicles, judging just from his general behavior. But we have done what is needed to be done here. And unfortunately, he has run in to Torchwood, which is to the east of us. So we're not going to be able to see him again today. But I will be patrolling regularly in the effort to try and find him again. And I'm very excited to spend more time with this particular individual. Oh, there we go, through the hole. So, let's go see what else is out and about on Juma Private Game Reserve. Uh, hopefully, I think we'll go catch up with those Ellies that I wanted to get to before they got to underneath that tree, which would have made it far more difficult for me to collect scat. So while we go see where those elephants that chase the leopard are, uh, let's jump back on with uh, Jamie and see what's going on on that side. Uh, Sabrina, while you were with Brent, I just did a quick checkup on monkey beetles in my book. And I didn't realize they were so closely related to fruit chafers. I mean, they basically are a different type of fruit chafer beetle. And uh, yes, we see lots and lots of fruit chafers. The reason why I was not as familiar with monkey beetles in this area is because they don't generally occur in this area. They're a species that is more towards the Cape. And I'm just going to stop and show everybody a picture of monkey beetles. And you can see what I mean when, they say, when I say that they are very similar to fruit chafers. They're just very furry. There we go. There's a whole range of them here. There's a blue monkey beetle. Here we go. Thank you to, for, to Katrina. Uh, sorry, let's try that whole sentence again. Thank you, Katrina, for sending through the information about the fact that the blue monkey beetle in particular is exclusive to South Africa, so endemic to South Africa, and especially around, found especially around Namaquiland. And if we just have a look at the maps of the different monkey beetles, we can actually see there's the blue monkey beetles map, so the Namaqua land around here with the green. We are, sure, it's such a tiny little map. We're in this little corner around here on this side of the country. 
But if we go down the page and we just look at the distribution maps, they're all types of fruit chafers that are essentially based around the Cape. Now, thank you very much, Sabrina. I learned something new today. These are the sort of the common, I'm just trying to find you an example of a nice common fruit chafer that we see regularly. This is a nice one, the regal fruit chafer that we've seen on Bushwalk before. Very, very attractive beetles. Beautiful. We saw lots and lots of them at the beginning of summer. Okay, no, I'm not gonna go through every fruit chafer that we could see. We could be here a very, very long time. It's all part of the sort of the scar or very similarly related to scarab beetles, the fruit chafers and the monkey beetles. There you go. Thank you, Katrina, and thank you, Sabrina, for that little lesson in monkey beetles. Right, on towards the southern boundary. In the meantime, Brent has found those elephants that were wandering around close by. And we can see the beautiful color coming through in the east. And we've just seen those elephants, and I think they've just smelt that leopard again. Judging from his behavior, he charged off. So maybe the elephants are going to chase the, the leopard again. We might get a visual of him. Um, but now even the elephants are being <laughs> slightly difficult. And charged off to the east. Do you see the Eddie from up there, John? Ah, there he is. Oh, we're just going to see a grey bottom or maybe a speck of grey through. Here we go, you can see the... the leaves moving, but the, the, I do guarantee there is a herd of elephants there. Unfortunately, as I said, it is on our... Um, outside of our traverse area. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to turn around and... Uh, see what's happening in the south. See what is out and about. And um, very interesting, or well, not very interesting, very expected. So Jamie heading towards Karula, there was always the chance she wasn't going to be there. So when a female leopard's got cubs and she's made a kill, she will traverse between where that kill is and where she's denning with the cubs. Now these cubs are getting close to two months old. So she might start taking them to, to kills. So fingers crossed that in the next day, while she's got that Inyala kill, she will, might even bring the cubs to us. And wouldn't that be absolutely spectacular? So just to let you guys know a little update, Um, James will be returning later this week from his holiday. So you will be back to three of us taking the drives. And I'm sure James has got some wonderful stories to keep you enthralled about his travels in South Africa while he was on holiday. Um, be great to have him back. Look at this, this is his tracks. I think he went for a drink down at the pan. But here are the tracks of that male leopard. So I think he went for a drink and he was walking back when he encountered possibly those elephant, and I think the combination of the elephant and the hyena was enough for him to depart. You can see nice big tracks for a young male. So I did get a report um, from my friends in the West that they think Tingana might have crossed back into Juma last night. So I'm gonna, it is literally the opposite end of the reserve, so I'm gonna slowly zigzag and meander my way through the reserve to get there. Let's see if we can find those tracks. So we might not be able to see our special 
leopard, and I must say, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed spending the last two days getting closer and closer and closer to him. And hopefully we'll have that opportunity again in the not too distant future. But for now, let's go see what else is out and about. And uh, while we move through there, I think it's time to put you guys to work and let us think of something to get you guys going and kickstart this early morning safari. So Megan is wondering, would an elephant, or do they just feel threatened by a leopard or would they try to kill it? Uh, or the, would they just intimidate it? So generally, elephants being the biggest thing around here, they don't tolerate any predators. They'll chase them all. And uh, if they manage to corner a leopard in a spot, they would definitely kill it. So even though a leopard doesn't actually pose any direct threat to them, uh, they would definitely try to kill that leopard if they manage to catch it. 99% of the time, the leopards are obviously far too quick and, and, and get away. And it's very seldom they'll actually catch it. But if they did catch it, they would kill it. And uh, they would do the same with lion or with hyena or cheetah, wild dog, whatever it is. And it's very strange. The only predator actually poses any semblance, or the two predators that pose any so sometime threat to an elephant, it's hyena and lion. And it's generally only to the young ones. Let's just see if anyone. No, I mean up and down here. So, oh, I did see. Where has it gone now? I'll keep looking out for it. But we do have a tree that's just started flowering, and we do see it quite a lot on this particular road. There it is. Now this is a brain teaser of note. And there we go. Very pretty yellow flowers. Now, the other reason I'm stopping, I was trying to see if there were any possible fruit chafers. I know you've been having a chat about monkey beetles, which are related to fruit chafers, and fruit chafers really do like the flowers. But I can't see any. Can you, jean -Ray? No, jean -Ray can't see any, any. But there we go. Let's get your brains in gear. and. Let's see who can tell me what tree this is, or what species of plant this is with these beautiful yellow flowers. I know I have done this before, but it was many moons ago. So if you guys know which particular little tree species or bush species this is, you can tell me and drop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Now, very interesting if we look at the same tree species that is growing next to it. But this particular individual has uh, had a bit of a hard time of it. And let's just have a quick look. I think I spot one. But you can see uh, it is the leaves have been stripped by caterpillars. Now, which caterpillar is a very interesting? Do you see them, Jandre? Look at that. Isn't this incredible? And I'm going to have to get a photo of these guys, and they are absolutely gorgeous caterpillars. Look at, whoa, did you see that jump? I, I, he jumped, he thought I was a bird trying to eat him, and he actually leapt. Now, with that coloration, he does almost look like a little bit of a snake. But look at how many of them there are. And there's, let's see if this one jumps as well. No, he's not a jumping caterpillar, only the one was. I'm gonna try, see if I can, Oh my goodness, he is absolutely gorgeous. I will put him back, don't worry. I'm just gonna put him on the dash so you guys can see him. Oh, he doesn't want to let go. Look at that color. And I'm pretty sure this is a butterfly larvae, just looking at the caterpillar. But I, I might be wrong, it might be a moth. And I actually haven't seen this particular species before and if I have I've forgotten it and it was a long time ago. So I'm just gonna have to I'm just gonna 
grab a few photographs of this guy and, and hopefully we will be able to get an ID on him at some point. But it looks, it's, they've completely stripped this little plant. I nearly gave away the game because I nearly said the plant's name. But I'm just going to try, let's go, let's move him out a little bit. And it's actually, he feels like sandpaper, really, really rough. But I mean, look at that beautiful coloration. Now, to get an ID, I'm just going to take a couple of pictures. That is stunning. Absolutely amazing. Oh, Jean you're very clever with your camera work there. So I can zoom a bit closer in on my phone then. And there we go. Now let's put him back. Oh my goodness. Is it still too a bit too there we go, look at that. Now you can see those little dots on him and those little dots literally I feel like sandpaper do you want to do you want to feel genre so I know I'm making it difficult for genre but it is incredible he's, he's really really rough and that's unusual because most of these little inchworms and caterpillars are, are really soft feeling now he's almost got armored plating oh absolutely stunning now I can't even see the eyes on it. So that's what I'm looking for at the moment. Wow. Now I'm absolutely fascinated to find out what particular butterfly or moth this caterpillar belongs to. So look at that. That is gorgeous. And, it, and it, let's just try and have a quick. Wow. They're busy stripping. They haven't quite. And there's lots of different sizes of them. Oh, he looks much happier. Immediately grabbed on. But now you need to let go of my finger, chump. There we go. Now, there's quite a few different sizes of them on these bushes. So we've got quite a few of these little trees. And again, I nearly gave away which name it is. So, I mean, if we look here, there's been some leaf stripping. And there are a few of them. But they definitely seem to be moving this way. I mean, look at this. There's almost not a leaf left here. And there's one, two, three. Four, five. Wow. Then we go to the next. Look, there's not, there's, there's about four leaflets left, but no caterpillars on here. Can you, um, I might have to move the vehicle to show you, actually. Let me, let me move the vehicle. It's going to be easier, otherwise I'm going to give Jandre a very difficult job. should work. So as I said, it looks like they're moving through the bushes and they sort of started in this general area and they're now onto here. But if we look at the base of the tree, you see all these little black spots. Let me try to collect some. Now, there's a couple of different things under the trees. Now, there's caterpillar poo. <laughs> and there is the little bits of leaf that have fallen down from being fed on. That is absolutely amazing. And you do get certain species that will literally completely wipe out. And uh, you must remember, a lot of butterfly and, and moth species are very specific in their host plants. So this is all that they will eat. They'll only eat the specific plant. And looking around, and I try to look, and we've got some terminalias and some marulas and other stuff around us, and there's not a caterpillar on any of them. It's only on this specific plant. And I mean, just as a quick guess, looking at this one, that's the one that's being fed on the most at the moment, there must be 50 or 60 of these little caterpillars all over it. So a lot of, as I was saying, a lot of butterfly and moths are very, very specific in their, their host plant. Now, their host plant is the one they'll lay their eggs on and the one that they will 
so the caterpillars will feed off. And in a lot of cases, um, these different host plants, uh, especially with things like monarchs and acreas, uh, will be the reason that they become noxious as adults. So they'll feed off and take the toxins from, from, from the different plants they feed off, and, and then that continues through into an adulthood, and that's why they can fly sort of la da and around and not worry about being eaten. I do have my butterfly book. I thought I had my butterfly book. And I'm just gonna have a quick look in the, the back of the book to see if there's anything that feeds off that particular plant. Again, I nearly gave away the name. I'm getting better at this. Often I used to give away the name. And... Yeah, apparently we do have some answers to uh, the name of that plant that is being feasted upon by the butterflies. So monkey orange is not correct. Lion's high hibiscus is also not correct. Charlie porcupine flower, no, that's also not correct. Weeping wattle, it is not. Clayton golden pea, it is not either. Oh, have I found a plant to stump you guys? Oh, sorry, who said it? Who said Shambok Pod? John said Shambok Pod. You're in the right family, John, but the wrong tree. So John is in, in, in the right sort of family, but he's got the wrong tree. It is, it is a relative of the Shambok Pod. I'm just going to try to see if I can see the larval form. So while we try to figure out what possibly uh, that caterpillar turns into, let's go have a look at Jamie, who's watching the sun appear in the east. Sounds like Brent's been having a wonderful time with his caterpillars. In the meantime, I've stopped on our southern boundary just to appreciate the strangeness of the weather over the last few weeks, that transitional period between our wet season and our dry season. And actually, that sort of ties into what I was thinking about with those caterpillars, is just how amazing it is that the animals have delayed those crucial parts of their life cycles, like laying eggs and producing caterpillars, for a time when there is a little bit, or there has been a little bit more rain. It's incredible to me that they are capable of doing that and the way that they have responded to the drought. The grass has shot up far more than I ever expected it to and the insect life has blossomed more than I expected it to. I honestly thought the rains had come just that little bit too late for it to have an impact, but it just goes to show just how resilient an area like this truly is. I've just had a very interesting chat to Roy from Arethusa. <laughs> Some of you may be familiar with him. Some of you may even have been guided by him. Roy tells me a couple of very interesting things. First of all, the Inkahumas are on Simbabili all five. So they have reunited once again and were chasing buffalo around Simbabili last night. And hopefully they will decide to come back at some point. Um, second of all, he thinks that Karula's den is on our side of the boundary. He doesn't think that she's still on Little Gowrie, which is to the south of us. And that's basically what I've come to check, is if her tracks do not cross the southern boundary from last night, chances are she's, not, she's no longer denning to the south. She's moved her cubs back towards us. It's all guesswork, of course, and until we see them, we will not know. But it's just an interesting little aside. And I'm checking very, very carefully as we drive along down this road that she hasn't crossed, because that will tell us a great deal of information. Generally, leopard cubs that tiny will be fed. She will go back to them as often as possible, at least once a day. 
So she would have gone, taken the opportunity to go back to them last night, and that would have been the reason that she's left that kill hanging in the tree for herself to come back to later. There was one other interesting... Oh, yes, wild dogs are... Well, there's tracks of wild dogs around in Coral, heading west. So in is quite far to the east of us, along the boundary but as you know and especially on a cool morning like this morning they could eat up that ground in a matter of minutes and come bounding unexpectedly onto Juma and all things change as you know when wild dogs decide to pay us a visit everything ups the gear including our vehicles and I'm just thinking about Jandre on the back of the vehicle with Brent <laughs> shame <laughs> with his sore foot He's going to be clinging on for dear life with his foot sort of trying to dangle out of the side if the wild dogs do decide to come and join us. There's no such thing as a slow and gentle morning when they come around. Those are all of the updates from my side. We're just going to keep checking along the southern boundary. Let's see if Roy's right. I mean... Wild dogs are pretty exciting, maybe even as exciting as Brent's jumping, self-propelling caterpillar. I'd love to know what species that is. I've encountered a few species of caterpillar that jump. I'd be very interested to know. from Julianne. Something that I sort of vaguely suggested a little while back when we were looking at the tortoise track and I said to the guy or I said to the viewers maybe you should screenshot the different tracks we've got around and that we show you and you can start building up your tracking knowledge that way especially for those of you who want to come and visit. So Julianne is going to wants to keep a tracking log of screenshots of the different tracks kind of like the bird list that a lot of our viewers keep and I think that's a brilliant idea and you can even superimpose arrows to show direction and the differences between the different tracks so you would like Impala and Waterbuck and other such tracks that maybe we don't always stop for and I mentioned this when Renius came about Renius the the guy who came through to, and he's probably one of the best trackers in the world, if not the best tracker in the world. He's been all over the place to teach people about tracking. And our downfall, all of us as guides, was antelope tracks. Because we got so used to stopping for leopard tracks and lion tracks and tracking those animals, that we've got a bit rusty on our antelope tracks. So maybe what we should do is Julianne's idea of stopping for the different, maybe more common tracks, but the ones that we don't always stop for. And we can all learn, or I can rehash my tracking lessons of old, and you guys can start keeping a log of the different tracks. The biggest problem, of course, at the moment is the light. It's going to be very tricky for us to find a nice track to show you that comes through nice clearly, but I will do my best, I promise. See if we can't find a nice track for you. And it's important. It is very, very important that, that stuff gets rusty as it about that went through a little bit of a signal dip and we are about to go through or cross around the Mulwati drainage line so I'm going to stay quiet just until we get to the other side and then hopefully the signal will reinforce itself on the other side of the crest should be 
a little bit better. No tracks for Karula crossing south. And that, to me, suggests that she's moved her cubs to somewhere around Juma, which is exciting prospects for us when she does decide to bring them out. We have a chance to see them. I know I'm personally so, so excited for that moment. I want to show you that bird. And he's not going to be terribly cooperative. In fact, I've just lost him. a scimitar ball, but they're very, very tricky to get on camera. We haven't managed all that frequently. Right, I'm going to go off and search for different tracks to show you. Let's find out if Brent has some answers to the question that he gave you and an answer to the idea on that caterpillar. So, uh, we did manage to find out which butterfly that caterpillar belongs to. And strangely enough, this is the amazing thing about being out here, is that you learn something new every day. Now, I have seen those adult butterflies everywhere, and I can identify the adult like this. Now, I can also identify the juvenile. So, there we go, that is the adult. The African vagrant that we see really, really commonly and let me just do that. There is the caterpillar like we just saw. And there is the exact plant we just saw them feeding off. And now I'm obviously holding my thumb across the name. <laughs> just in case there's some very clever people out there who, who might get it. Now, it is a very, very cool. And, and that's the amazing thing is that that's why I love doing what I do. I learn every single day and I never stop learning. And I think even the day you think you know it all about the bush it is the day you are very incorrect. So anyone who thinks they know it all needs to go back to school. I mean, look at that. We've just seen another one and the leaves are stripped on there and there's probably another caterpillar on there. Look at that. So, we do have some very clever viewers, and one of them's name is Rebecca, and she is from Santa Barbara. And Rebecca is saying that she, in their area, they have a butterfly that is host to the Senna species. That one is called the monkey pod. Uh, and the very, very particular sulfur butterfly feeds off that Senna. And here we have African vagrants that feed off that Senna. So I was just gonna let them pop past have a quick little meeting. How's it, Orbs? Morning, everyone. Yes. That Ingrid got chased by a dwarf, and he ran into Torchwood. Um, so if you go past uh, Pipeline Junction, there's that first mitre drain. You ran across there, and there's lots of dwarf in that area as well. Ooh. Good luck. Cheers, guys. Have fun. <coughs> so that was Aubrey uh, from Juma with his guests. So I was just letting him know where that male leopard across the road in case he might be able to catch up with him. I am quite enjoying these cool mornings. And it is wonderful that the cats might be moving a little bit longer. Ranger is wondering, how did I know which end was the right end to check for the eyes? 
and he said jumping caterpillars are certainly a first for him as well. Now I've got... Okay. And since we don't have the live caterpillar, we do have the book. Now, if we look, and you can see where the legs are, you can definitely see that very big around area. And when I was looking at that particular individual, you could actually see his mouth parts. See, you can see the round head and then the tapered off tail. And they've actually got legs right on the end of the tail. So that's how I knew which side to look for his eyes. And, and they're very nondescript and very, almost invisible in this particular species. Now, uh, if we look at other caterpillar species, now oh, I saw a nice. Oh, the hornbills are talking much better next to us. Uh, where is that one I was looking for, that particular picture? Uh, well, not the one I was looking for, but you can actually see the eyes a lot more clearly in this little caterpillar, which belongs to one of the yellows, which we also see here. Look at all these talking hornbills making so much of the noise. You just roll forward, you'll get a better view, Andre. Yeah, I'm crossing the There we go. Red-billed hornbills. Tuk, tuk. <laughs> they are very comical when they are doing this particular call. So there's two of them in the tree. The one isn't uh, too visible. Oh, itchy. So they're very fluffy, and that's from the cold weather. They'll puff themselves up to catch the air between their feathers and their body to warm up to create a little insulative blanket. And as we head towards our winter months, we're going to be seeing a lot more puffy animals and birds. And they have taken off and disappeared, so we shall take off as well. Can I get an update for this morning, please? Yeah, morning for me. No, okay. So, good morning to Aaron from the land of the long white cloud, better known as New Zealand. Aaron would like to know if we've ever seen an African data on Juma. I seem to, yes, I have. Uh, in the Buffles Hook Dam, but it was many, many moons ago. I think probably February or March last year is the last time I saw an African data. So they are very particular in what they like to eat, fish and whatnot, but we can chat about them shortly. In the meantime, Jamie's got an actual bird, not a figurative bird, to show you. Really beautiful male battalier, silhouetted against the grey skies. They are such interestingly striking birds with that bright red face and those red legs. And I can only assume that the bright colour there is for mating purposes, to display how healthy they are. I can't think of any other, there's no, re there's no real reason besides attracting a mate that birds are or take the brightly colored approach as opposed to the more cryptically colored. Now this is one of the few bird species in the raptor family that you can very clearly see the difference between a male and a female. In this case, we're looking at a male batter there. Oh, look at that, he's showing us the brown patch on his back so beautifully. Now the difference between the males and females is that females have more white. You see where the top of the grey, or the grey strip on the top of the wing ends? On a female, there is a second strip of white on the lower primary feathers of the wing. That's the most easily distinguishable male from female in the bird of prey family. In all birds of prey, the female is larger, but that's not very easy to see unless you see them right up against each other. And if this gentleman decides to take off, he does decide to fly. You'll be able to see underneath his wings, his wings are half black and half white. In the females, they are almost completely white underneath with just a thin strip of 
black outlining the primary feathers at the bottom. What I'll do is I'll just find you a picture so I can show you exactly what I mean. I think they might be one of my favorite birds to see. They are so incredibly regal in their stance. So it is a snake eagle. It's called, its old name is a short-tailed snake eagle. They've got incredibly almost absent tails. You can see how the wings extend way past where the tail usually is on most birds of prey. And that's an adaptation for the way in which it gives them a great deal of agility, but it also makes their flight very, very unstable. So if you watch a batelier, you can always tell almost instantly that it is a batelier that's flying. The tips of their wings sort of tilt upward a little bit and they rock from side to side. I thought that Rolo was going to dive bomb him, but it changed his mind. So this is what I was talking about with the difference between the males and the females. So there you can see the second band of white that I was chatting about with a female that is not present on the male, which is how I know that we're looking at a male batelier. You can see what I mean about how short the tail is. And in fact, in flight, the feet even extend past the tail. And there you can see what I was chatting about when they take off with the female at the top, with that just a thin strip of black underneath and then the half white and the half black of the male. Now, it's also important to remember that rocking motion, the way that they fly, because a juvenile batelier, as with most juvenile birds of prey, is what we would sort of maybe describe as nondescript. Very scraggly, quite scruffy looking birds, and can be, or could be considered to be quite difficult to tell apart from the other juvenile birds or even browner birds of prey but it's that rocking flight motion that really gives them away. Now, apparently the name Batelier comes from a famous French tightrope artist. So descriptive of the way tightrope walkers rock from side to side, and a way of describing the way in which the Batelier flies. I've spoken to quite a few French people, and I'm not sure how many French viewers are watching us this morning, or people with lots of experience in France. I have never found a single French person that knows what on earth I'm talking about when I tell them that the, bat, the name Batelier comes from a French word and a, the name of a famous French tightrope walker. So it does, it has become a, something of a, I mean, that's, that's, that's where I've been told that the name comes from and I think that's what all of us know, that the name, or where the name has come from, but I've never managed to get confirmation from anybody who's ever heard that who would be in a position to know. One of those funny aspects of the way in which animals are named. And agreed, sacrosanct. I also really enjoy sitting watching them and seeing them perched. And I just wanted to show you at first, before I try and get a little bit closer, but I am going to try and get a bit closer. I wanted to drive down this road anyway. But we very often see them flying over us. We get a brief view. But we do know this family that lives on this road. I'm just at the junction of Leadwood and Mumba, for those of you familiar with our geography, so on the eastern side. And between Batelier and Leadwood Road is a male and a female, and sometimes their adult offspring come and sit to join them, and sometimes they also have a juvenile that still hasn't obtained its adult plumage. And that process, of course, for the juvenile can take up to seven years before they reach sexual maturity and get their full striking black, white, and red combination. They spend a lot of time looking like scruffy teenagers. One of the most iconic birds. I've often spoken about the fact that they have so many, or such a very strong local belief attached to them. interesting gulping motion. Let me see if we can't get a slightly better view. 
as I was saying, they, there is a local legend attached to the Batalier, that the Batalier is essentially either seen as the embodiment of the creator, or it is seen as the first creature ever created. And it watched the first sunrise from its perch in a tree, just like this one. And it will be there when the last sun sets across Africa. Just an interesting little legend that is attached to them. Now, Penny, who is watching in South Africa, Penny was just talking about the name Batalia. Oof, somebody is all puffed up at the moment. <laughs> That's a way of stretching out the little ligaments and tendons in the mus and the muscles that are connected to the feathers, stretching them out, realigning them, and then putting them all back together again, relaxing them. That's why he's puffed out like that. Now, Penny tells me that apparently there was a huge furore when the name Batalier was put forward as to be changed to the name Short-Tailed Snake Eagle. I actually remember that. It's a funny one, because we actually started this morning talking about the consensus about the naming of birds and trying to make it the same across the world, across the globe, for the common names of birds. And it's interesting that the Batalier managed to to keep its original name. I like the name Batalia. I also really like the name Gymnogene. And I'm quite sad it was changed to African Harrier Hawk. Makes total sense. I mean, I don't have any rational reason for feeling that way. It just, Gymnogene is just a more interesting sounding name. And the Grey Lurie as well. I mean, the Grey Go Away Bird, to me, the grey go-away bird sounds like a child named it, which isn't, I suppose, as necessarily a bad thing. And it makes sense because they're not, they're actually more closely related to plantain eaters rather than the Lurie family itself. So yes, I, I see the logic. Perhaps it's just that I was a little bit set in my ways in knowing the different names for birds as a kid. And now I'm having to change that. The long-tailed shrike is another one. It's now changed to magpie shrike. That one I actually quite like. I'm quite a fan of that name change. And then it gets even more complicated when you get to the fly catchers and the wren warblers and the scrub robins. That, like the Huglin's scrub robin, that is now has a completely different name. And I, I can't even for the life of me remember what it is now. I, it's totally escaped me. It's like having to relearn everything that you once knew. What do you think, mister? Do you like the name Batalier, or would you pre prefer to be known as Mr. Short-Tailed Eagle, Snake Eagle? Doesn't quite have the same ring to it as Batalier. Thank you very much, Deanna. You've answered a question that's been in my mind for a very long time. Now, apparently in the 1800s or the late 1800s, Deanna's been doing some research and discovered that, yes, a French circus performer or a juggler might have been termed a bastelier. I'm so sorry if you, any of you are French or fluent in the French language. I'm sure my pronunciation is mangled. I've never had a particularly strong grasp of French or the way in which it's pronounced. But there we go. So we have got a little bit of truth behind the name. Georgian, just confirming what I mentioned earlier, that the reason we're talking about circus performers in association with this bird of prey that is sitting in front of you is the side-to-side -side rocking motion that they do when they fly. And welcome, Georgian. Georgian is watching in Illinois and is one of our very regular viewers, or very long-term viewers as well. Okay. I think let us leave our beautiful Batelier in peace and see what other things we can find. <laughs> Dave 
David Allen, on sort of thinking along the same lines as I am, has said that the reason the French get so confused whenever we mention the Batelier is because our pronunciation is so mangled that they just have no idea what we are talking about. Um, and you've also said through the correct pronunciation, Batelier, does that sound right? I can imitate a sound if you make it for me. I just don't necessarily know how to pronounce it if I... <laughs> that might, that, yeah, that might have been a little bit Germanic. I try, I try my best. <laughs> I'll stick to Shangan pronunciation. Bye bye, Batonier, or however you say your name. It's also apparently very good luck to have a batelier. Batelier, batelier, hello. Defecate on you. Um, I can say from not a very close call, very close experience, that I would not consider it to be. There he goes. And immediately that scroll. Alarm calling. Well done, Dave. What was I about to say? I got distracted by him flying away. Oh yes, um, it is very, very, very smelly defecation. You really don't want to be defecated on by a battalion, but apparently it's good luck. You can interpret that as you will. I, I will, I'll take my luck as it comes. I'll try and dodge that kind of incident. Now that is one of the birds that could be responsible for Karula, if it does happen, it might not, but for Karula losing her kill. The reason I say that is Batalias do, they do have the most incredible eyesight, as do most birds out here, but they also fly quite low, below the tree line. And with their keen eyesight, that is one of the birds that is usually the first to arrive at a kill or at a carcass. And they are not above scavenging, although they are very efficient hunters on their, in their own right, but they're not above scavenging. And what very often happens or frequently happens with, particularly with a small kill in a tree, is that the battaliers and the tawny eagles start to go and feed on it. And they dislodge it from the branches of the tree and it drops to the ground and it might, it will obviously be while the leopard's away having a drink or resting up in the shade away from the kill. And that then puts it at risk of a roaming hyena encountering it and making off with it. And very often, vultures will follow battaliers. Apparently, you saw, you, with Karula's last kill around Treehouse Dam and with Brent, apparently you did see a juvenile battalier feeding off it and having dislodged it from the tree. So it just goes to show that they are regular culprits in terms of finding and dislodging kills. And that's why vultures, if they see battaliers starting to descend and they see a tawny eagle start to descend, they might decide that it's worth their while going across to investigate. It's interesting how animals learn to survive by observing the behavior of other animals. Hooded vultures, for example, and even white-backed vultures, will fly behind a wild dog pack because they know that they are almost guaranteed to get at least something of a meal while the wild dogs move through an area. They are just such efficient hunters and they eat very, very quickly and then off they go again to find something else to feed on, leaving the lucky vultures behind to enjoy the scraps. just working my way in a grid around Karula's kill. I still haven't found her tracks, but that does not necessarily mean that I haven't driven past them in this light. She just would have to walk over a slightly harder patch of road, and in this light, we've been, chances of seeing it is very, very slim. out there. 
a lovely view, however, across our wilderness area. And just looking out across that view in the wide expanse of untouched wild, well, not untouched, that's, that's maybe taking things a little bit far, but wilderness conservation area and a truly wild area, Wendy was wondering a little bit about a comment that I made about the Kruger National Park. And I said that something like around 2% of the Kruger is, uh, is open to the public. Wendy was wondering a little bit about the other 98%. Um, there are, I wish I had my Kruger map. I'm just trying to see if I do. I don't, though. There are enormous areas, Wendy, where there are just no roads, no buildings. There might be some infrastructure there left over from the days when parts of Kruger were still farmland or people's individuals individually owned farms. So there might be old war holes, there might be the odd ruin of a, a farmhouse or a cottage. But it's only really because people in Kruger can't drive off road. You've essentially got 100 meters on either side of the road in the camps, and that's pretty much it. Then there's also some private concessions. Um, the, big, the, the best example being Singita Labombo which runs along the east, uh, yes, eastern side, I'm getting my east and west confused this morning, runs along the eastern side of Kruger and that is only accessible to Singita staff and Singita guests. There's a couple of other private concessions within Kruger as well. And then there's also, there is, for example, roan antelope breeding camps in the sort of middle northeastern side of the Kruger. And then other than that, there's just this vast, untapped wilderness, which I think is the best part about it. We don't need to see all of it. There will be little research stations set up. There are a lot of no-entry roads that lead either to section ranges roads or anti-poaching stations. Roads that have been seen far more regular use over the last few years, unfortunately, in an anti-poaching respect. So that's pretty much what the rest of the Kruger is made up on. And Wendy, this afternoon I'll take out my Kruger map and I'll bring it out on drive. I'm not sure if you'll be able to watch this afternoon sunset safari, but just drop us a question and let us know that you're watching. And I'll make sure I keep my Kruger map handy and we can talk a little bit more about the details of the different parts of Kruger. Right, another grid for us to do. In the meantime, let's find out what Brent's up to. So we've uh, traversed the southern boundary. We saw where Karula crossed off to go feed her little ones. And I'm now following up on that report that Tingana might have come back to Juma. So we're just checking this western sector quite carefully, hoping for some tracks. Or even better, when I said, jean said he wanted to see a leopard, I said, we'll go look for tracks. He said, I didn't want to see tracks, I wanted to see a leopard. And he is being quite demanding since he has already seen a leopard this morning even though it ran across the road at high speed in front of us it still counts as I, one of my old trackers used to say foot if you can see the tail it's a leopard so we have seen a leopard but unfortunately we weren't able to show you that leopard he was highly mobile so we're going to try and see if we can find you a better visual of a leopard and it will be nice to see tingana he had a little bit of rotten luck losing his Impala kill to the Birmingham boys, but I think he was so fat, he didn't really mind. Welcome to a first-time viewer, Natalie. And Natalie is wondering, do we get monarch butterflies here? We do, Natalie. We have uh, our own version of a monarch called an African monarch butterfly. And uh, hopefully in this area here, we might actually see one. So let's keep a lookout for the African monarch. So they're not, they don't do those big migrations uh, like the, the the American monarch do, and I find that fascinating that they migrate over 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 generations. 
Now, the one butterfly we do get that migrate is the one we saw the larval stage of earlier, and that's why they are called an African vagrant or an African migrant. Uh, and sometimes hundreds of thousands of them migrate together. But moving on from the butterflies, we have some, oh, African monarch. See if jean can catch him. Oh, jean is not the biggest fan of butterflies. They are one of the harder things for us to film. There we go. There we go, Natalie. That is an African monarch. And I'm probably going to get a smack on my head from, from jean -Dre. I'm trying to avoid him. There we go. jean that's very mess messy, messy camera work, you know. <laughs> I'm only teasing. Uh, butterflies are near impossible to track with a camera. Uh, but let's just, uh, there you go, Natalie, that's an African monarch for you. But um, hopefully those other animals I spotted haven't disappeared while we've been following the monarch. I think they might have. Oh, no, there they are. And there's some... They're just hiding behind the bush. Hopefully they'll move out shortly. There you go, a female warthog, and what probably could be termed as sub-adults now, her offspring. And it's just, I think, if we go back, we might get a better view. Oh, termite mound. How's that, Chandra? So, oh, look there, hello, little one. Lisa in Washington is talking about a very interesting symbiotic relationship that warthog have with banded mongoose. And quite often, they will seek out troops of banded mongoose uh, and let them dispose of any parasites that are on them. And Lisa's wondering if we've ever seen such behavior in the Sawi Sands. Well, Lisa, I have seen that behavior before in Zululand. I've never seen it in the Sawi Sands. Uh, where we are, we don't get that many banned mongoose. I've only seen them three times in just over a year. But further south in the Sabi Sands, on the big rivers, there, there are more banned mongoose. And I, ne I never saw that particular behavior displayed there. But as I said, I have seen it in northern Zululand before. Yeah, she's done very well. So what we've got here, we've got two different groups of her youngsters. And you've got those two little ones that are from this year, and then we've got one from last year, a slightly bigger one that's on the far right at the moment. Now, warthog, very interestingly, are one of the only animals that have aloe suckling. And aloe suckling is when different females will let the babies of others feed off themselves, and it will always with warthog be related individuals. jean we have a nest builder in our vehicle. I just can't help but notice. Let's try to see what it is. This tiny, tiny, tiny little spider who's decided. Oh, so, there, we, there it is. And it's busy <laughs> constructing a nest in the vehicle. And actually, I think. I'm unfortunately going to have to let it go. Oh, where'd it go? Did you see where it went? No. Is it still on my hand? No. I'm trying to have a look what type of spider this is. Uh, I'm going to release him because, oh, going through my fingers. Where'd he go? So small, it's disappeared. Oh, there he went. There he is. Aha. I'm at a loss to which spider species this is. All I know for this spider's, oopsie, sake, and it's hanging from a thread, that our vehicle is not a good place to set up shop. So we don't want to hurt the poor little guy. So I'm just going to 
you know, don't you escape from me. So I'm literally holding tiny pieces of thread at the moment. Oh, and I'm going to put him in this little acacia. Oh, no, 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 don't go up my Steve. Oh, there we go. And there, you see him there? So tiny, but now the thread is still attached to my finger. So every time I move, the spider moves. I'm just going to wrap the thread. There we go. No, no, it's still attached to me. No, go. <laughs> oh, that is possible. I, I still wonder sometimes. It's attached to my nose of all places. Okay, spider's on the tree. Okay, so shame. Otherwise, I suddenly saw it. It actually developed quite a a com complex web system um, in the front of the vehicle. So unfortunately, I think we picked it up while we were driving. And there we go, the warthogs are still there. Completely ignored my shenanigans. Okay. So as I was saying about warthogs, that they allosuckle, which is quite unusual um, outside of the predators. But it, 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 they keep it within the family, so uh, mom, daughters, etc., will allosuckle their young. And uh, it is a sort of a kinship thing. It's a, 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 to promote genetics. So the, the mother will let her daughter's um, baby suckle, piglets suckle, because it ensures a better chance of them survival. And vice versa, the daughter will let the mom's piglet suckle, just depending on who's closest. So when you see a sounder, which is the collective noun for warthog, together, uh, and there's multiple females with multiple babies, it's very difficult to actually ascertain which individual baby comes from which mother because they will suckle from both both adults. Very, very interesting. And they're about to start their rutting season. So they do rut and the male warthogs will fight for rights over females. And there's two different strategies that they employ when it comes to uh, mating, uh, which is again unusual. Normally these, most animals will stick to a single strategy. So male warthogs will either defend a, a territory that holds multiple females in it and chase all the other males and try to keep the females inside it. Or they'll defend a resource, a, a mud wallow, a, a water hole, a very good grazing area. And so it just depends on the individual warthog which, which, which strategy that works best in the particular area they're in. Yeah, well, we'll leave those warthogs. We're still in search of leopard tracks. Whoop. Uh, Jeffrey says it kind of looked like a crab spider. Oh, I, I don't think it was a crab spider, Jeffrey. It, it looked far more closely related to either bark spiders or bird dropping spiders. So a big sort of... Uh, Brownie gray fat body, even though it was a very little spider. But uh, crab spiders have very distinct uh, shape in their front legs, so definitely not a crab spider. And a crab spider is an ambush spider, so even though they do have webs and they are able to produce silk, they generally will, will, will try to mimic or sit in a certain spot to ambush. They won't spin a web like this guy was doing, he was spinning a web to catch passers by. And uh, so definitely not a crab spider. Um, I just saw a little wax ball carrying nesting material. I'm just trying to see where he landed. There he is. You got him, Jandre. Look at that. Beautiful. So I thought it was nesting material. I actually think it's a snack now. He's got a nice bit of bit of grass there, and there's some nice seeds on there. Oh, he dropped it. Oh, cleaning the beak. So beautiful little. Oh, off he goes. Seed eaters, the blue wax balls, and they often nest actually in quarry bushes, like we are going through here. And they have a, a fascinating nesting strategy: is that they look for paper wasps, uh, so a type of wasp and hornet species that makes those sort of r rounded paper balls and, and each individual segment has, a, has a, an egg laid in it. 
and are, is looked after by a colony of wasps. So they will actually actively seek out these colonies of wasps and then they will build their nest right next to it as a sort of added deterrent to any predator that if they disturb the wasp nest, that uh, the wasps will get upset and sting whatever predator might be there. Now I've actually seen snakes trying to get to a wasp nest being absolutely annihilated by these wasps. So eventually they actually gave up and didn't try to eat the eggs out of the nest. So obviously a very effective strategy for a very small bird that doesn't have many defenses. And so instead of nesting high in a tree, they actually nest often quite low in these little bushes, but they always, almost always 90% of the time, choose to nest right next, next to a paper nest, a paper wasp's nest. So uh, it seems a few of you missed the answer to the plant quiz that was being fed off by the instar larvae of the African migrant. And the answer was it is, uh, it used to actually be called uh, cassia, but the name has changed, it's a senna. A senna and that particular senna, uh, if I remember correctly, I can't remember the common name, I'll have to double check, but I'm pretty sure it's called a monkey pod senna. Uh, so, Maybe Jamie can check. I think she's got the tree book with her. So if she can check Monkey Pod Center, I'm pretty sure that's the one. But uh, speaking of Jamie, let's go see what she's up to. Don't think I have the tree book. Um, I'll just check for a second. Give me one moment. The Monkey Pod Center. I have a book of local legends, snakes, reptiles, and wildflowers and frogs. Sorry, everybody. No sign of... Oh, and tortoises. I have a tortoise book as well. But not the tree book this time around. Just remember to grab it from our library of reference books and pop it in. What very often happens is we take a book out to go and read up on something between drives and then completely forget to put it back. And I think that's what's happened there with the tree book. The monkey pod Senna. We'll just double check that. Nurgo was wondering a little bit about the terminology that we've been using on drive and was wondering what does a concession refer to in South Africa since in America it can refer to a sort of a, a stand somewhere where you can go and get food maybe it's a fair or something similar um, we very seldom use it in that context Concession is a conservancy area made up of different properties owned by different landowners. So, for example, the area that I, the reserve on, was known as the Greater Makalali Private Concession and was made up of seven different landowners. In a way, the Sabi Sands is exactly the same thing. It's also a concession where you've got all of the different landowners coming together in, with common goals in mind to drop all their fences, to allow the wilderness or the wildlife to roam free and unimpeded. So that is what we are referring to when we talk about a concession. The Kruger Park, start that sentence again. The Kruger Park concession. It refers to not just the Kruger itself, but also to all of the surrounding land mass or farms that have joined up and become part of it. And that's what's actually led the Kruger Park to become as enormous as it has. Seems to be a bird on a dead tree day. Just listening to this crested barbet trill away. Can you see him there, Dave? He's on the top 
left side. You got him? Yeah. Well done, thank you, sorry. Awkward angle for you. Just look at how long that trawl goes on for. Still going, still going. Still going. Okay. Oh, and he's back again. Now, imagine trying to trill or to whistle like that for up to a minute or longer at a time on one lung full of air. The incredible thing about the crested barbet is that they circular breathe. They've got two tracheas or a split where they can breathe in and breathe out at the same time. Like very many talented or very, actually very few very talented wind instrument players can perform circular breathing breathing in while they breathe out that's what gives him the ability to troll constantly like that and a call like that is to announce his presence to other crested barbets and also the contact call to his mate or her mate both the males and the females in the crested barbet call like this. And he is relentless, still going. Now, there's no sexual dimorphism between the two, which is why I said it could be him or her that is happily singing away. And as I said, both call, so impossible for us to tell. There also, there is a second one calling somewhere. Every now and again, I hear it responding. And both the male and the female will take care of the chicks. And in fact, you very often see them together in family groups, so cooperative breeders. There's quite a few bird species out here that adopt that strategy. Essentially, the parents' offspring will stick around for a little bit longer before they disperse and help their mom and dad out with the next generation as surrogate, or not surrogate parents, but additional babysitters is maybe a better description. Oxpeckers do it, ground hornbills do that, and so do crested barbets. The one bird I'm still dying to get on camera is the black collared barbet. I hear them so regularly around our camp, but I hardly ever see them. It's a relative of the crested, slightly smaller, with a slightly more robust looking beak and I'm very surprised at the fact that I've hardly ever seen them here. I used to see them all the time, just a, just a little way away from where we are now. And I'm sure that would be a new bird for a lot of you. There are lots and lots of different species of barbet throughout South Africa, oh, throughout Africa, but this is the black collared barbet that I'm referring to. And it even comes with a rare yellow head in very, very limited circumstances. And I'm just, I'm just struggling to get them on camera. That dual call, the do puddly, do puddly, do puddly, that is the male and female singing together with the most phenomenal timing. The timing is so precise that you would barely be able to tell that it is a bird or that it is more than one bird calling. You can hear a grey-headed horn, a grey, a grey hornbill as well, whistling away. Okay, Barbet, we're going to leave you to your morning chorus. Oh, this is actually. Sorry, I've just just had a look at this. I don't know why it's taken me so long to notice, but this is a massive, massive civet tree. The civet tree is basically a latrine where a civet regularly def defecates and moves through. So if we have a look, I mean, there's all kinds of exoskeletons of millipedes in there. I'm not sure why it's taken me so long to realize there. You can see that ground up white stuff is, the civet is one of the few animals that is capable of processing the toxins within a millipede and consuming them. And there's some fresh civet, what would you call it, civet feces in this midden, in the civet tree. So the civet is still utilizing it as a way of 
marking out the territory. It's, it's, a, it's a latrine or a midden. It's basically a communal area. It's like civet Facebook, where civets come to update their general status. Um, you know, defecate, leave behind. It's like it is. It's like updating their status, whether or not they're single, whether they are reproductively ready, how old they are, where they're going to be, when they've arrived, when they've checked in, checking into the Nyala Road South Civetry. <laughs> you get the general idea. There's lots of animals as well that do that, a very similar thing. Spotted hyenas do it as well. There you go. We're going to leave the Civet Facebook and its social media updates. Insomniac and Sharon, you can say you were asking when I was listing all of the books that I had in my book collection. You were wondering about the books on local legends and in my bush library. You were wondering a little bit about whether or not I'd be able to read some of that, or whether you could read some of that because it sounds fascinating. That's where we get, it's where Brent and myself get a lot of our little local myths and legends. Something that I've had to brush up with. I read them all as a kid. It's there, and you can buy them. I'm pretty sure that you could buy them. Um, I'm sure they're available in the States. Books entitled When the Hippo Was Hairy and other such books that will give you a little bit of a glance into local legend. And Louise had, had brought us a book from Johannesburg that was in her collection of local myths and legends throughout South Africa or throughout Africa that I haven't managed to delve into since it's arrived but thank you Lou for that and Marcus but um yes we will try I will delve into that maybe at a flat cat maybe at a flat cat sighting we could sit and read some local legends maybe while we're waiting for lions to do something or in a situation like yesterday with Karula sleeping off a heavy meal Perhaps reading a local legend would be quite a nice idea. And we do try and throw one in every now and again when it's appropriate. Mm. Okay, so Karina definitely hasn't come across to the west. As to where she has gone, your guess is as good as mine. But I'm basically starting to draw a picture in my head by where she isn't, or where she hasn't walked, as to where she has walked. And that's just to give me a general idea as to where she might have moved her cubs to. She loves this drainage line system around Inyala Road South, which is why I'm checking very carefully along the road for tracks. It doesn't look as though she's come across in this direction. This is where, this is very close to where her original den was, where she gave birth to those cubs, and where Brent found her just hours afterwards with the little bundles of joy. I had a thought that maybe she might have decided to move them back into a similar area, but I think that she's just got so many different options that she hasn't decided to do that. Okay, well, we've done a thorough check. I think now it's time for us to return to the carcass and just see if there's any sign of her doing the same thing, maybe coming for a late breakfast. And if she hasn't, then we'll just move on further and double check even further out. Good morning to Suki, who is one of our new viewers. And Suki was wondering a little bit about our, what we refer to as traverse area. So essentially where we're allowed to drive and where we're not. Now, we, we had that conversation about concessions and the fact that different properties are owned by different people out here. And yes, we are restricted as to where we could go. We've got our own little personal piece around Juma and Arethusa, and different lodges have different approaches. So the Juma vehicles that drive out of the Voyatella and Gallego lodges 
are able to drive right up around Biffles Hook, Torchwood and Cheetah Plains and those areas. So their traverse area is slightly larger than ours. It's important to keep vehicles have an impact the number of people have an impact not just on the environment but also on the quality of the sightings for the different guests because if you've got too many vehicles moving through then you might have to cycle through with only five minutes at a time spent with an animal so there is an amount of restriction there's all kinds of politics involved there's all kinds of financial considerations to be considered and as such, yes, we are restricted to our wonderful patch of Juma and Arethusa, but we are going to be expanding that to Cheetah Plains as well, which we are all exceptionally excited about. It gives us an opportunity to add some new characters to our storylines or even follow up on characters that have been part, you know, like Karula's cubs from previous litters that have since grown up and moved away from her territory and out of our Traverse area. So to be able to expand to Cheetah Plains will give us that opportunity to now build up more of the story since they left us. And that to me is an exceptionally exciting prospect. Every, every lodge anywhere has a restriction as to where they can go. We can't, as much as we would love to, we can't move throughout the entire 60 odd thousand hectares of Sabi Sands. We certainly can't traverse the whole of the Kruger and beyond, the four million hectares of Travis, but in fact we wouldn't want to. There's definitely an advantage to us having our little piece of land that we spend so much time on because we get to know each individual animal so carefully and we know the roots, we know the secret little pathways that we that they use, we know where there's special exciting trees to show you. I'm, just, I'm going very, very slowly through this drainage line. There's nothing more cryptically coloured than a leopard lying down. And I don't want to miss her. But it doesn't seem like she's decided to return to us. Kill is still in exactly the same position. So Karula hasn't yet decided to return. This spot to sit yesterday with all of the birds, the different birds calling. You can see there's a lot of meat still around the four quarters of this little inyada. Shame. Had a very, the roughest possible start to life. It's quite a young inyala. All right, we're going to have to do the turn again, Dave. All right. <laughs> uh, chatting a little bit about the Cheetah Plains prospect and getting a chance to see, in particular, Quarantine and Kunuma, the previous cubs of Karula. Paige in Tennessee was wondering whether or not their scat has Actually, not a hundred percent sure. Either way, once we start seeing them regularly again, we will recollect it. I'm fairly certain at least quarantines has been, but we will double check that and we will be collecting that scat to in order to figure out exactly who fathered quarantine and Kunuma. Okay, I'm going to do this turn, and while I do it, it sends you back over to Brent. Want you to cut down? So we have been looking for Tangana and he's done an absolute mile a minute from where his tracks crossed. He's now down near where we saw that unrelaxed male and he couldn't even be chasing from what I've heard. So we're gonna scoot off to that area to see if we can have some leopard luck. So what we have been doing in the meantime, and I'm afraid uh, he's not going anywhere, so I'm not going to show you just yet but we do have a little inchworm on the dashboard uh, that we've been trying to discover which butterfly he belongs to and uh, I think John Ray is laughing because I, I'm pointing to him and so John Ray feels the need to film him while we're, we're traveling a mile a minute um, 
but I think this guy is actually belongs to a moth, and John Deere found him in the footwell. And uh, when we, as we drive out of camp, there's a buffalo thorn that in the early morning has about 25 or 30 of these little guys hanging from silk. And I think as we drove past this morning, I think one of them dropped in. But I do think that he possibly belongs to a moth rather than a butterfly, or she, who knows the sex of a little inchworm. If Tingana has been in that area, that could explain why that male actually dashed at a mile a minute. It could be a combination of hyenas, elephants, and a potential threat in that area in terms of Tingana. It seems to be getting colder this morning rather than warmer. I'm just buttoning up again. So it's going to be fascinating to see what is going on uh, down in the east as we maneuver our way there. Hopefully, Queen Karula will be back on the site uh, on the Sunset Safari. I don't feel she's going to come through again this morning. But another really big positive is, as I said a little bit earlier, that those cubs are going to start getting to the age which she's going to start bringing them to kills. Maybe not just yet, or maybe our luck is so good it could be this evening. But not a bad fly, but a rather uncomfortable beetle has gone into my shirt. Ooh, I don't know where he's gone, but he seems to have disappeared. Now, the one very big danger we face during the summer months while moving between areas at high speed like we're doing at the moment is the potential for a black eye. Now, there's some very aggressive creatures out here. And this isn't one of them, the one who's going to give us a black eye. So quite often when you decide to start moving towards something that could be a little bit far away, so you start getting a little bit of a heavy foot, you might encounter a dung beetle out on its patrols looking for poo. And um, what happens is that we are probably going at about 30 kilometers an hour, more or less, maybe. Might be a little bit faster, might be a little bit slower. And a dung beetle, on average, flies at about 30 kilometers an hour, which means no matter the size of the dung beetle, it is making contact with your face at about 60 kilometers an hour, which is quite painful. Oh, sorry, I think Orby's calling me. Sorry, guys, I'm just listening to the radio for a second. Jeremy? Standing by? No, I think uh, one of you guys, uh, maybe stand by where it was a farm. I'm still on the boat here, but the direction is moving. Sorry, guys, what's in there? Straight that direction where it was uh, another Kijima uh, inward. Okay, copy that. Thanks, Aubrey. I'm on Twin Dams now. I'll start making my way into that area. Sorry, guys. Uh, Jamie, I was trying to orbit this a bit now. I'm about to hit uh, Buffalo's on Cut Line uh, to head there. Uh, whereabouts on Twin Dams are you? Okay, copy that. Perfect range, no problem. Um, I'm at Chile Dam. Uh, copy. Um, yeah, I'm about to hit Gary Catline, so a little bit closer. So, if you don't mind. Absolutely, go for it. Okay, just 
organizing some logistics there. And look at this, he's hanging on for dear life. We haven't lost him. We haven't given up in identifying which possible lepidoptrid that this little guy comes from. So from what I can hear on the radio, while I still try and do up my Genre, that is a bird. We're on our way to find a leopard. Sorry about that, folks. Just, you know, sometimes we have to just watch our camera a bit carefully. Um, we could ask Genre to go for a walk. <laughs> that could be quite funny. Oh, he's pulling a side face. Genre is currently on crutches, just so everyone knows. Um, but uh, what looks like has happened is Tingana has picked up the scent of that Gujima male, that unrelaxed male we've been spending the last few days with. And it looks like he's heading straight towards where he had that carcass. So very interesting and we're going to try to get there as fast as possible. Aubrey's having a bit of trouble following uh, Tingana through a thick block. So hence my uh, Ferrari safari at the moment. So while we uh, speed towards that direction, uh, Jamie has got the largest of the bovids to show you. Well, this is exciting or interesting dynamics at play in the leopard world. So while Brent speeds across there, I've just stopped at the buffalo that have decided to spend their morning at Chele Pan which is where we first saw them. And I just wanted to show you this gentleman. We've seen him before. As you can see, it's due to either an injury or some kind of clot or cataract, he is completely blind in his left eye. And you can actually see it in the way that he moves his head. In the way that he watches vehicles go past, he always has that slight tilt to favor his right eye facing in front of him. And I mean, something like that will not disadvantage him hugely. Well, here come the oxpeckers for their breakfast. Something like that won't disadvantage him enormously. He can still see out of his right eye, although I'm not sure if I'm imagining a slight milkiness to that eye as well. But as you know, buffalo are reliant more on their sense of smell and their sense of hearing. But he's definitely not a boy that you want to surprise on foot in the bush. That blindness in his left eye will probably make him feel a little bit more vulnerable and therefore a bit more inclined to be defensive. Hey boy, shame. I wonder how that occurred. Could even have been impact from fighting other males. <laughs> we have a new view viewer watching on YouTube. Gasteria, you were saying that this live stream is the best thing that has happened to you all month. Well, I hope that we can continue to be the best thing to happen to you all year. Perhaps that, that is aiming very high, but that would be lovely. We've got so many wonderful things to show you that I often, I, I get excited just thinking about the prospects of the year ahead. So little leopard cub sightings that are going to come forward in the next few weeks the possibility of cheetah planes and cheetah. There's just so many extraordinary things to view in the bush that it never gets boring and it certainly never gets predictable. Even when you are sitting watching buffalo having a rest in a pan like this. Now comment on something that I've observed. As wonderful as it is to see the buffalo eating the green grass and to have the meals that they've been having, I have noticed something a little bit sort of gastric themed and that's the fact that all of the buffalo in this area seem to have diarrhea and I just wonder if their bodies didn't get used to processing the dry grass and the sort of the bad nutrient levels and all of a sudden they've been faced with this exceptionally rich and highly nutritious food and I wonder whether it hasn't actually almost upset their stomach slightly. I wasn't going to mention it for a while because I thought I was imagining it, but it seems to be across the board, all of the buffalo. Isn't that an interesting impact of the drought that I don't think any of us predicted would have happened? Amazing how their digestive systems were adapted or had been adapting themselves to cope. Here he goes again, tilting his head to the left, 
so that he can watch me out of his right eye. Interesting that they chose to spend the morning wallowing. It's not terribly warm, although I imagine actually the water must be quite warm. It's probably like lying in a, what would we call it? Not quite lukewarm bath, maybe. Uh, Sandra, just while we're watching these buffalo wallowing in a pan, you were actually wondering about what a pan is. And Sandra, yes, you write about it being a body of water. Quite specifically, it's quite a small body of water and it's mostly naturally occurring. So a dam is man-made. A pan can also be man-made, but it is slightly smaller. Our pans generally are formed from puddles collecting in an area. So the puddles collect around maybe even a seep line with water flowing from underground and collecting in a particular area. And it makes a puddle. And then a warthog, maybe, let's for say, for example, comes along and rubs himself a little bit in the mud, has a great time. And then a buffalo thinks, hey, this is a great idea. I'm going to do that too. And then the elephants jump on board and think, actually, this is a brilliant plan. I'm going to dig my way and make this a swimming pool. And then what you get is you get these puddles that usually in a rainy season, in a, in a solid rainy season, are full, full of water for about six or so months. Now, this is the first time that we've really seen the pans full. We're at Chele Pan at the moment, and it's referring not to this little mud puddle that the buffalo are in, but to that beautiful, almost, almost dam-like pan that is at the back there. So a pan is basically determined by size when, they, when we refer to that. And we do use it. It's a pond. Essentially, it's a pond. Oh, itchy ear. Those ox pickers irritating you, boy. Here we go, he's going to settle back down. <laughs> Splashing the water from the pan all over the show. And Dingo, you were wondering a little bit about buffalo, watching them in the water. You were wondering, can they swim? Yes, they can. They're not the strongest swimmers. They much prefer to wallow in shallow water. But they can, if necessary, swim. They generally avoid it, but they, most animals, most all mammal species can. Interestingly enough, the one that can't, it is, it's one of those weird exceptions. And I suppose maybe what I'm about to say is a little bit misleading. But the mammal that cannot actively propel itself by just using its legs to swim is a hippo. A hippo that lives in an aquatic environment for the majority of its time cannot swim. The, the legs are too short. They're not, the feet are not webbed enough to carry the bulk of the animal. So what they do is they sink to the bottom. They can control their buoyancy to an extent. They sink to the bottom of the dams and they push themselves along the bottom. And they can actually reach enormous speeds in doing that. And that is one of the ways in which they actually keep the water holes and the water areas of, this, of the lakes and the dams and the rivers that they move about in clean and free from silt. So they make sure that they don't get clogged up. He's having such a good scratch around his horns. I bet that must feel very nice when you're covered in ticks and itchy bites. James Richards, having a look at our big dark buffalo, has read or has heard somewhere that the dark color of a buffalo is disadvantageous in the bush and wants to know um, because of the heat. So obviously a dark animal absorbs heat more readily than a lighter colored animal. So James's question is why is the Cape buffalo dark? I have absolutely no idea, James. My guess is that a slightly darker color is harder to see, particularly in thick vegetation. I'm trying to think. I'm desperately racking my brains 
about why a buffalo is dark and not light. It's the way that they've evolved to be. There's obviously must be some kind of reason. And the cows are slightly lighter in color, and younger buffalo are slightly lighter in color than these dugger boys, as they're unofficially known. I don't know, do, do any of you have suggestions as to why they might have evolved to be dark in color as opposed to light? Light, I mean light to the opposite end of the spectrum is definitely a disadvantage. Albinism in, in African wildlife generally doesn't survive, but there's a reason why it's so incredibly rare out here. And that's because the animal that is born albino, so without any pigment, will actually fall victim to the sun. And I know that what the little albino baby elephant that was born a couple of years ago ended up dying from sun exposure just because the dark skin color wasn't there. So maybe there's something to that. Maybe it's the way in which buffalo are tolerant of the sun, protects them from skin cancer and other such um, maladies of a sunny and warm climate. Yes, it will certainly mean that they're hotter, but then I suppose they're well adapted to dealing with that. But that is an interesting one. I honestly don't know, James. It is an interesting one. Because impala are not, I mean, antelope, most of the antelope species are brownish in color. I'd love to hear if any of you have any suggestions or if maybe it's just one of, one of those things that it's just the way they are and that they've adapted in a different way to cool themselves down and to handle that extra heat absorption that the dark color provides them with. All right, I think let's continue onwards. See if we can't pick up on Karula's tracks coming out of this drainage line. Her kill is just on the other side. And a good morning to Tiffany. Just talking about the buffalo and their itchy, scratchy bits with coming from tick bites. And in fact, I've just noticed I've got a load of tick bites around my ankle. Tiffany was saying, with all those ticks about, is there a risk of Lyme disease? And the answer is no. Our ticks in Africa do not carry Lyme disease, so the bites from a tick bite are not, do not have as serious a ramification as they do in America and within Europe. You don't need to stress about Lyme disease out here. The only thing that a tick will transmit to you every now and again, and it is a very, it's quite a slim chance. We're more at risk of it because we walk regularly through the bush, but even so, I'm pretty sure I've developed something of an immunity to at least the strain that we get in this part of the bush. We'll see, I shouldn't have said that. I really shouldn't have said that. So what they can transmit is a bacteria known as the rickettsia bacteria. And it makes you feel much like you've got a really bad case of the flu. Your joints ache, you feel nauseous, you just, you just feel horrible. You get a pounding, splitting headache. So no, no, no Lyme disease, but tick bite fever, easily treatable with a course of antibiotics. Right, let's go and have a look at another large and dark colored animal, also lying down in the middle of the road. Look at this, guys. So we're standing by, uh, waiting for the leopard to come from the east. And we've been told to wait exactly where we are, but where are we waiting? We've got this wonderful view of these little ellies, there's three of them lying and playing in the middle of the road. Oh, having an absolute whale of a time. <laughs> Look at that. Yes, they oh, are very cute. <laughs> now, this cool weather, uh, you often find that you can't get up. There we go. The ellies playing like this. So if the leopard decides to change his mind and which direction he's going, at least we know we've got some elephants to go look at just down the road. There we go. Mr. Tingana should be hopefully appearing on this road over here. According to Aubrey, Aubrey's just told me to wait right here. And uh, he's not too far from us. So his general direction has been to the west. 
Hopefully he keeps marching and doesn't stop for a little snooze on his way. I think it's unlikely. I think he's picked up the scent of that mail we were with earlier this morning and last night. And he's now very upset at finding an interloper in his area. So he's going to be marching around, probably scent marking quite a lot, and maybe even vocalizing, even though it is daytime. feeding and those elephants have crossed into a juma so if we don't get any success with the leopard we we'll always pop down to have a look at the ellies just while we're sitting here a nice quick reminder about time changes that are about to be Sorry. Copy, thanks, Orbs. I'll stand by. There's also a Shambu and Law Vanchila cut line slowly mobile to the north west across the road, and probably 400 meters from Junction Pipeline. So, as I said, now I, I, I found this quite challenging yesterday, so let's see if I can do it a bit better today. So, we are going to be having some time changes of the 1st of April as we move into our winter months. And uh, sunrise safari will be starting half an hour later, so it will not be going out at 5.30 a.m. Central African time, but will be going, will be going out at 6 a.m. Central African time. So not ending at 8.30, but ending at 9 a.m. Central African time. Now. What this means, it'll be starting at midnight Eastern Standard Time and ending at 3 a.m. Eastern Standard. So I do understand if some of you need to nap, <laughs> it is quite late, but fortunately there are records of the drive so you can catch up with them uh, when you wake up. And an Pacific Standard or Pacific, what's it, Pacific Western, I can't remember what it's called. Pacific Standard, Pacific Western, I think it's Pacific Western. Uh, 9 p.m. Uh, well, the, the, the Sunrise Safari will be starting and ending at 12 a.m. So starting at 9 at night and ending at 12 midnight. The Sunset Safari will be starting at half past 3 p.m. in the afternoon, Central African time, and ending at half past 6 uh, p.m. Central African time. Now, Eastern Standard will be starting at 9.30 a.m. and ending at 12.30 p.m. And uh, Pacific, Western Pacific, Pacific, Pacific. There we go. Tingan is on his way towards us, so that's good news. So we'll try to wrap this up without too much confusion. So in the Pacific time, it'll be starting, uh, the sunset safaris will be starting at 6.30 a.m. and ending 9.30 a.m. So we are still waiting. Mr. Tingana has got mobile again and moving towards us. So hopefully he's going to pop out. He's on this road. This road in Torchwood is called Piper Line. I can hear Aubrey's vehicle. It doesn't sound too far away. But as he did just now he could stop for a little snooze on a termite mound but I am hoping he is going to pop up on that horizon marching in all his splendor straight towards us so while we wait because it could be two minutes it could be 20 let's go see what Jamie's got oh, while Brent waits patiently in eager anticipation We've got something to distract you for the meantime until the leopard does decide to make an appearance. A lovely herd of impala. Exactly where they were sleeping when we started our sunrise safari. And in fact, some of them have only just got up now. They've definitely been enjoying the opportunity for a morning lie-in on a 
on what? Wednesday? Yes, Wednesday, on a Wednesday morning. A nice late start for the Impala herd. What I want to do is shuffle closer and just show you something with the youngsters. Now, our regular viewers were watching when the Impala lambs were born and we started seeing these tiny little things on spindly legs wandering about. It's now almost impossible to tell, not quite, but it's just listening to the game drive comms, sorry. But it's amazing, it is phenomenal how much they've grown. Even the late birth in parlor lambs are still almost the size of the adults. And I wanna just find you a young male. There we go, there's one that's about to cross the road. He's just going behind the tree. He's gonna come out onto the road. But further to the right, Dave. Sorry, he stopped to look at us and there he goes. That one flicking his left leg. <laughs> What's on your foot? Look at the tiny little horns that are coming through already. The speed that these animals grow at is incredible. There's another little one walking behind. These young males are already starting to be affected by the hormones floating about. There you see, even went up and approached a female. So I've seen them fighting each other using their brand new horn sets to try and have, pretend they are adult males and to headbutt each other. Incredible to witness. And I often think we don't stop to appreciate Impala often enough are such lovely antelope. There he is using the loose bottom teeth in his lower jaw to groom, almost acting like a comb. And the impala are getting more and more exciting to watch because the males are definitely becoming more interested in the females and more interested in chasing each other around. Oh, big herd. Megan, you were wondering as we, oh, here comes the male. It was him that caused that sudden rush forward, a big mature impala ram. He's definitely got the rutting walk going on. And he is a beautiful big male. He's unfortunately got his timing a little bit off. He, Ewes are not going to be ready to mate for at least another month. But he's already feeling the effects of the testosterone. And you can see how the females are all keeping as much space away between them and him as possible. <coughs> he's phlegm and grimacing now. He's been scenting the urine. And he might continue to do that when he moves out, a bit more out into the open. So that phlegm and grimace, the picking up of the top lip, the top lip almost like a snarl, is a way that most of the animals out here will draw scent towards their organ of Jacobson that sits at the roof of their mouth and is essentially adapted for tasting the smells that come through to them. We have residual organ of Jacobson. He's phlegm and grimacing again. I wish he'd come out a little bit into the open and continue to do that. It might be a bit more, a bit easier to understand. There's actually a lamb suckling still as well. So even though they are fully grown, there is, Dave, just to the left there, there's a...